Hello everyone! Welcome back to your Chem Help session on stoichiometry. On this session we're going to focus on reaction types and we got a lot of stuff to talk about so let's jump right in. In the very beginning we're going to start by talking about reaction orders um, and we're going to do so talking about elementary reactions as well as how you can get multiple step reactions as well. Alright, so the very first thing to point out is focusing on how molecules actually interact with each other during these types of reactions. So, first thing to bring up is that a molecule itself is defined as any uncharged group of atoms that's held together by bonds. Now, you might notice that this is defining a molecule as exclusively uncharged. That is a very exact definition of it, but colloquially, um, the way that most people use the word molecule will refer to both things that are charged and uncharged if it's atoms that are covalently bound together. Um, so an example would be some kind of a Oh, I'll give an example of acetate. Sorry if you don't know what that is, um, but it's a carboxylic acid that's lost a proton, and it's got a negative charge. And so it's carbons and oxygens with a negative charge. Even though it's charged, people do often call it a molecule, even though technically you would call it an ion. So just be aware, a lot of people will use those terms interchangeably. We'll try to be very precise today. All right, so then uh, a chemical reaction occurs any time that you get um, the atoms of molecules get rearranged. Now that can happen from different molecules coming together and interacting, or you can even have a single molecule rearrange its own atoms for a chemical reaction to occur. All right, so whenever we talk about these reactions, um, the reactants are the things that you start with, and whatever you make is called the products. You'll often also hear people talk about reactions being pushed to the right or the left. Um, and so the standard is the reactants are on the left-hand side, just as when you're reading a sentence, we often start, as you can see, on the left and then work our way towards the right. The same thing is true for chemical reactions. Products would be the right side, reactants would be the left side. All right, so then um, during these chemical reactions, there's lots of different reasons that the atoms could be in, uh, rearranged or forced to rearrange. Um, one's because the bonds just break between the reactants, and then if you break bonds, well, that's forming a chemical reaction, right? It is a chemical reaction giving you new products. Additionally, you can have things actually bump together, form new bonds, or as we said before, even have bonds rearranged within a single molecule as well. All right, so um, let's go through an example here. Um, so looking at this diagram, we want to uh, tell whether or not a chemical reaction has occurred. Notice that when we look at our first reaction, we've got two little yellow dots. Those are supposed to be hydrogens. Don't worry, though, about the specific components there. Um, as well as an oxygen bound to a hydrogen. Once again, a big blue dot bound to a yellow dot. Notice that the types of bonds have changed when we look at our products here on the right-hand side. Remember, this would be your reactants on the left-hand side. That would be your products on the right-hand side. Um, and so since we do have new bonds, new bonds were broken. Notice we've actually severed the bond between those hydrogens there, the little yellow dots. And we form new bonds, forming a new bond between one of these yellow dots and the blue thing there, uh, forming, as you can see on the right, what's meant to be water. Um, so that's how a chemical reaction has occurred. We've rearranged these molecules. We have new bonds that didn't exist before and lost bonds that had previously existed. All right, here's another example. So we want to know why rusting iron is a chemical reaction, whereas melting iron is not a chemical reaction. I want to focus first on the right-hand side of this explanation, where we talk about melting iron. Now, melting is the same, uh, well, whether you're talking about melting, or freezing, or boiling, or condensing, or all those different phase changes, it is a phase change. So whenever you're going through any kind of phase change, turning something that's a solid into a liquid version of itself, and you can think of ice you know, being the solid version of water. When it melts into liquid water, that's the liquid version of water. And then if you boil it and make steam, that's the gaseous version of water. In all of those, though, there's no actual chemical reactions happening. It's still the same water molecules. If Whether you're looking at ice or steam water or liquid water, they all look like this. It's two hydrogens bound to an oxygen. It's not changing. Now, the density changes, the way they move around changes, but the actual bonds between them are not changing. Um, so the same thing is true when we talk about iron. If you're melting it, if you manage to boil it somehow, it would be very difficult. Um, it's still just a phase change. But when you talk about rusting iron, you might remember that rusting happens when you leave your metal out in the rain. Um, that's a type of specific chemical reaction. Um, when you expose it to water and oxygen, those water and oxygen molecules are actually going to steal electrons away from the iron, making it iron with a positive charge. Um, in fact, iron, when you do oxidize it, oxidizing means that you're going to remove electrons from it. And notice that we said water and oxygen tend to do this. Notice water has oxygen. 
Oxygen, of course, has oxygen. It tends to oxidize things. That means steal electrons away. Now, if you don't know those terms yet, that's perfectly fine. We'll go through them in future lessons. Um, but just to show you an example, by oxidizing iron, you're going to form two different main versions, iron 2 plus or iron 3 plus. Now, once again, I'm not going to get into the specifics of why we know it's 2 plus and 3 plus. Um, but if you've got skills with your periodic table and know how to look at trends, you'll be able to figure that out as well. So the summary of this question is, since you are changing the chemical structure of iron, you are removing electrons, you're changing the way that it, you know, its charges that it has, um, that would be considered a chemical reaction. But just phase changes, nah, no big deal. Not a chemical reaction. All right, so here's another example. We've got dimethyl ether and ethanol forming two different molecules. So of course, in the future, you'll be comfortable to know how to draw those structures, just given the name. We're going to go through the basics today, so we won't um, assume that you know how to do so. It doesn't really matter. Um, but dimethyl ether, and actually, I'll draw an example of each of these, and I'll underline so you can see it. Dimethyl ether, uh, that is where you have an oxygen in the middle, and then uh, two carbons on each side. I guess one carbon on each side, excuse me, BCH3. That'd be the carbon on the other side, CH3. Um, additionally, um, as you get better with chemistry, you'll know to identify that oxygen there should have two lone pairs. Um, you can determine that using your valence electrons. Once again, we won't get into determining structures with valence electrons today, but just um, background that is something you're going to have to be comfortable with as you get more advanced in your chemistry studies. Um, so there's a picture of dimethyl ether. If we were to draw a picture of ethanol, we'll do a different color coding here so we can tell the differences. Um, that is a two-carbon version of uh, an alcohol. So you've got a CH3 group, a CH2 group, a bound to an OH group. Um, notice if you look here, um, these are both made up of the exact same atoms. You've got two carbons, you've got six hydrogens, you've got one oxygen. We want to know how it's possible that you can have the same atoms yet be different. Notice when you look at the structure here, the reason that these are different is because the bond arrangements are different. In this case, you've got two bonds to carbon from an oxygen. Here you only have a single bond between carbon and your oxygen. And if you ever have different arrangements of those bonds, that means that you have different types of molecules. So just because they have the same atom does not mean they're the same molecule. You can arrange them differently. Um, for those of you advanced students, you might recognize these could be called structural or constitutional isomers of each other. Um, that, off, that term often doesn't get introduced until much later in your chemistry classes, often organic chemistry. Um, but notice they can have the same chemical formulas and still be totally different molecules. That's the most important part here. All right. So there's another example. Um, let's go a little bit more back into these learning goals, and then we'll jump through a couple more questions and look at a couple different types of reactions. Um, so when we talk about these actual reactions, um, there's two main things that can happen. You can have something splitting apart, or you can have things coming together. I mean, so whenever you look at reactions that are actually um, have two different things, so if you have one molecule here, one molecule here, if you want to form a bond between them, they literally need to bump into each other. There must be a physical collision in order for those electrons to get close enough that they can start sharing and forming a new covalent bond. That means you're sharing electrons between those two different atoms. Um, and so the main ways that we'll see this then is that you could either have two totally different molecules combine, or you could just have the exact same molecule combine. All right, so as we said, you can have two of the same types combine, or you can have two different molecules combine as well. Um, let's actually show you a little picture of what this looks like um, in terms of just getting a visual to associate with these types of arrangements. All right, so here's an example. Notice we have two different molecules. In this case, we're simplifying it, right? Don't stress about whether it's ethanol or methanol or whatever the compound is. Just think of it as species A and species B. In this case, you've got two different molecules of species A, and those two are going to collide, stick together, and thus you have a new compound, a new molecule, two of them stuck. So that is a chemical reaction. Um, we also talked about um, having two different ones. So notice if you have two different molecules coming together, in this case, we'll call it molecule A, molecule B. These could also be just atom A and atom B. We don't know what they are. It's just two different things that we have in solution. If they were to collide together and decide to share their electrons, as we said before, covalent bonds are sharing electrons. We have whole classes dedicated to that as well. Um, then we have a new molecule. Thus, a chemical reaction has occurred. All right, so there's your two main types of reactions where things actually come uh, together. Um, additionally, you can also talk about things 
Um, well, actually, before we get to the other type of reactions, I want to point out one very important point, um, and that's when you think of these actual molecules, these are very tiny little things. They're moving through generally a very large space relative to their own sizes. Um, and so the chance of two things colliding is fairly difficult, but that's the only way that chemical reactions can occur. The chance of getting three things to, to collide together at the exact same place at the exact same time is very, very, very difficult, unless if you're talking about very extreme conditions, you know, like maybe inside the center of a star, you know, it's really hot and high pressure. Yeah, anything can happen. But in chemistry lab that we're doing things, you're not really going to see this happen. Um, and so for the case of most introductory chemistry classes, um, we're going to say that it's negligibly small, so we're only going to really have two things combining together at the same time. We'll talk about more complicated reactions later on that do have multiple molecules all coming together. Um, but in terms of the elementary reaction, and that's what we're going to talk about here, um, it's really just two at once. All right, so. Uh, let's look at an example here. Um, here's a problem. It says, if three types of molecules are available to react as reactants, um, how many different types of collisions can occur? All right, so we've got three different types of molecules. And as we did before, we'll just call this molecule A, molecule B, and molecule C. So we want to figure out how many different types of collisions can occur to give us new products here. So we talked about there's two main categories. You can either have something combined with itself, or you could have something combined with another species. Um, so notice if we have compound A, we can say, all right, well, one of your possible products is you can get AA, where an A combines with itself. You could also say that compound A combines with compound B. So like, okay, well, you could also have A and B combined together. Um, additionally, you could say that compound A combines with compound C. Now to go further down the line, you could say, all right, well, that's true of A, and that's all the possible reaction types of A. A combines with A, A combines with B, or A combines with C. You can also say the exact same thing about B and C. So notice you could say B, well, B also can combine with itself, giving you BB. Or you could say that B combines with C, giving you BC. All right, so that's all the types of combinations with B because notice we already have B and A, and now we have B and B, we also have B and C. Um, so those are the only possible types of new bonds that we can form. And so then we will end with C. Well, looking at C, we get to, of course, say that C combines with itself, giving you C, C fused together. We've already talked about C combining with B, and we've also talked about C combining with A. Um, thus, we have all the C reactions accounted for. Um, so the total number of products, as you can see, is six. All right. So um, there is the introduction to the types of bonds and the types of reactions that we're going to be having. What we're going to do for the rest of this class is we're just going to get more specific. We'll talk about how these different things combine together um, to give you different types of products. All right. Um, so one thing that we did not talk about yet, um, and so we, we did talk about this at the very beginning here, was we mentioned that reactions can also split apart. And so not only can they combine together, but you can also have on the reactant side something that has already been stuck. And so another type of reaction to mention is that they can actually split apart as well or rearrange. To give you an example of what that looks like, let's look at this right here. Um, and so uh, notice here if you have two different things that are stuck together in this case, once again, we're going back to the fundamentals. We're just going to call this molecule A. You got two of them fused together. So it's able to actually split apart. So this is a rearrangement where we break that bond apart and now have two separate species. So just as this reaction can go forward where two things combine to give you one product, you can also have a product, or sorry, a reactant split into two different products, which is what we did here. All right. So that brings us to our next main learning goal. We'll get a bit more specific with the names here. And um, we will talk about the different uh, orders of elementary reactions. Now, we're going to use this term a lot when we mention elementary reactions. And so we mentioned this previously, but elementary reactions are the basic reactions that occur in chemistry, which is the three categories that we talked about. You can have something that's the same as itself combined together. You can have something combined with a different molecule altogether, a different species, or you can have something just split apart or rearrange. And so these are your elementary reactions. Yes, they get more complicated. Yes, you can have three things eventually combined together, but these will be the fundamentals that we talk about. All right, so elementary reactions, as we said, are simple one-step reactions, right? Two things coming together combining, something splitting apart, or two of the same things coming together and binding. 
All right, so they can be classified by the number of reactant molecules that you have within that reaction. Um, so if it's only one reactant molecule, that's called a first order reaction. If you have two molecules, that's known as a second order reaction. Um, so notice all you're doing to determine the reaction order is counting the number of reactants that you have in an elementary reaction, right? which is just a simple one-step reaction. We'll get more complicated later on. Um, and so as we said before, if you're going to talk about these second order reactions, you've got to have two different reactants. It really comes down to only two different options. You can have something combined with itself, basically colliding, getting a new product, or you could have uh, two different molecules coming together colliding and getting a whole new structure of bonds then. All right, so there is no third order elementary reaction. I'm actually going to put a box around that word elementary. It's very important to point out um, because we are going to have third order or even larger order overall reactions. Once you have a complete chemical reaction, we'll talk about that soon. But in terms of these straightforward, simple elementary reactions, um, there is no such thing as third because that would mean you have three different things all combining together at the exact same time, which would be very difficult in standard conditions, you know, in any kind of chemistry lab that you're working in. Uh, we won't talk about chemistry of the center of stars and fusion. That gets a bit more complicated. All right, so let's do some example problems. Um, so looking at this diagram, we want to determine whether it's first order, second order, mixed, or second order the same. Um, and so notice in this case, we have two different types of species in solution. We've got this double orange dot little guy. We've got this big green dot big guy. And notice that when you look at the products here, it looks like we've combined together the green dot and the yellow dot. Um, in fact, it looks kind of specifically like this guy is going to steal one of those and it's going to break off one of these little orange dots as it goes. And so as such, since we have two different species reacting together, right, could even be one species, but we are, do have two things that are combining and forming a new set of bonds, that means that this must be a second order mixed. Um, so that would be a second order mixed reaction. All right. Next one. Um, what is the reaction order when we've got this thing? Yes, this might look a little complicated, um, but it looks like it's going to rearrange to form a whole new product there. But notice, once again, we have only one thing. So if you ever have a chemical reaction that starts with a single reactant, that means that it is a first order reaction. And this, in fact, is a first order reaction because you've only got one thing. It's going to rearrange itself, form new bonds. Awesome. Um, but it is just a first order reaction. Um, in fact, um, we've got a, um, actually, here we go. I believe this is a nice little image of it. Let me show you what that looks like. And so notice in these first order reactions, you've got that same single species right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange it. Notice it gets rearranged. We're going to shuffle around the bonds, but you don't have anything new being added. You don't have two things combining. You're taking the same initial set of atoms and just rearranging them around, giving you that final product energy. All right. So... When we look at these kinds of graphs, too, this might be a little bit new, and so we'll, we have classes that get further into this in the future, but I want to give you a little introduction here. Um, notice that when you look at the X and Y axes, um, the one that we focus on here mostly is the Y axis, that's the energy. So notice that whenever you have all of your atoms bound together, it's actually lower energy when you have them in the process of reshuffling. And that's because, generally speaking, when atoms are able to share their electrons and form these compounds, it's a lower energy and more stable situation. Um, and so this is called a transition state. That's the highest energy in the process of that shuffling around. All right. Um, so let's try out another problem, and we'll see what that one looks like. Um, so looking at these different reaction orders... Um, we've got uh, Y barium, carbonate decomposes into barium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. We've got magnesium and chlorine and all of these. Um, so before we get into these questions, let's look at one more little animation to give you a visual of what this really looks like. And so here's an example of a second order reaction. And yes, we'll have a couple on that page. But notice whenever you have a second order reaction, what we're effectively doing is we are taking two different things. Notice, well, in this case, it's two of the same thing, but it's still two molecules. And what we're going to do in this case is combine them together. So same as before, you start off with two different reactants. Even if they're the same thing, you have two reactants. Uh, they're going to react together. We're going to shuffle around the bonds. That creates this high-energy transition state. Um, to give you a little background, you'll sometimes see this symbol, where it's a T that's crossed doubly. It's kind of like the symbol from uh, it was a movie back in the day, but that's okay. So that's your symbol for transition state. Um, and then you get your final products with that rearrangement of bonds. 
So notice you started off with two things here, and you end up with one thing on the bottom. And that's the key. All right, so let's check out that problem and go through all of them. Um, so we want to figure out, as this barium carbonate decomposes into barium oxide and carbon dioxide gas, the key here, though, is that you're starting off with one thing. We've got this barium carbonate. Now, you might not know what carbonate is or where you find barium on the periodic table, but notice right now it's listed as a single thing. And then it's going to split apart into two different things. Looks like part of it is taking the barium chunk of it. So that's another one there. And the other part of it has the carbon part of it there. Um, so since you have one thing splitting into two different things, or more importantly, since you're starting with just one thing, we know that this is a first order reaction. All right. Checking out the next one. Now we've got magnesium solid, that's MG, uh, reacting with chlorine gas, Cl2. Well, if you have, as you can see, two different things combining together, we don't even need to know what the products are. If you have two things reacting, then by definition, this would be a second order reaction. All right, for our third example here, we've got this reaction of carbon monoxide, a gas you've probably heard of. It's not good to be around at all. It's very deadly. Uh, combining with, that's nitrate, NO3 gas. Um, we want to figure out what's going to happen when these two combine. Once again, it doesn't really matter if you know the reaction that you're going to get. That's carbon dioxide and nitrite. doesn't matter. What matters most here is that you have two different things. And if you have two different reactants combining together at all, but no matter whether you're getting one product or two different products here, since two things react, that means this must be a second order reaction. And these two must physically collide in order to get your total products. All right, well, let's keep moving. Um, so that is the reaction orders. Um, let's get a little bit more specific, though, because we didn't talk about the actual names of these reactions and how we classify them. And so the third part of this class is going to be classifying these different elementary reactions that we've already started looking at, um, and then talk about how these synthesis reactions occur and how we name them. Um, so let's check this one out. All right, so um, these are the main classifications of elementary reactions. Um, so as we said, we can further classify them by the types of products that are produced. Remember, the reaction order, whether it was first or second order, determ was determined by the number of reactants that we have. Now, how those reactants actually react with each other, how they split apart, how they make new products, that's going to give us a more specific idea of what specific type of reaction is actually going on here. All right, so um, one type of reaction, we've actually seen this word previously, is elementary decomposition reactions. So in these, you've got a single reactant that splits into two different things. That would be considered a first order reaction. Remember, it was a single thing at all. If I ever have a single reactant, that means it's going to be first order. This is just specifically called decomposition. All right, so now this is different than the rearrangement, right? We saw that one previously. This isn't just rearranging the bonds. This is actually breaking your reactant into two different parts. Um, all right, so that's called an elementary decomposition. Um, and so this can be caused by lots of different reasons. If you shoot enough heat at a compound or if you irradiate it with a lot of energy, um, shoot charge through it, could, or it could just happen randomly, um, some kind of energy is happening which allows those bonds to actually break. All right, let's, let's see what this actually looks like. And so I'm um, looking at an example of a decomposition reaction. Um, this is HI. Notice we're starting with a single thing. We start with that single thing. Which, once again, it doesn't matter if you're talking iodine or protons, the hydrogen there. The key is you're starting with a single species, and it's going to split into two different species. Um, so whether you call it A, B, or just H plus and I minus, it's the same idea. It's a decomposition. Something's splitting apart. So that's one of the major categories of your uh, elementary reaction types. Uh, the second one, let's me jump back to this real quick, um, is starting to combine things together. All right, so synthesis reactions, otherwise known as a chemical or combination reactions, excuse me, are where we actually have things combining. Um, so you have two different reactants combining together to give you a single product. Once again, two reactants means a second order reaction. We already talked about that. Um, so as before, it could be two of the same things coming together or it could be two different things. Regardless, it's a second order reaction. These things are combining, that is the key. Um, and so you can summarize that as either, you know, Notice we're calling it C and D here instead of A and B. It doesn't matter. It's just a letter representing a different type of molecule or atom. In this case, we have C and D combined together, or just two of the same things, just as before. 
Um, this, as we said before, usually happens because these things actually collide. There is a collision of your molecules. When they collide, they decide to share their electrons um, or do some kind of rearrangement. All right, so let's hear synthesis, otherwise known as combination reactions. All right, let's try out a couple problems here to see how this works in the real world. And there's a giant list of problems for us to classify. Uh, the reaction type, so let's make sure we answer both of these. Both the reaction type of these reactions as well as the reaction order. All right, so let's go through these all piece by piece. On the first one, looks like we have some big single species that's going to split into one, two different species. And so if you ever start with a single species by itself, we know that this must be a first order reaction. And more specifically, we know that since it's splitting apart, that would be a decomposition reaction. That's your first order, specifically a decomposition. All right, looking at the next one. Notice now, it looks like we just have one thing that's rearranging, but remember, we gotta look at our balanced equation. You actually have two different molecules that are gonna combine together to give you one molecule. And if you ever have things that are combining together, that means that we have a second order reaction. Once again, it doesn't matter if it's two of the same things or two different things, two things reacting means second order. Um, and so when we have forming two things forming new bonds, as we said, we would call that a synthesis reaction. All right, moving on down the line, as you can see, same thing as before, we've got two molecules. In this case, it's two different molecules coming together. Um, and so this is another second order reaction. Um, and since this is two different molecules, we can call this synthesis specifically mixed because it's two different species coming together. All right, going down the line, you know, I'm sure you've noticed the trend. You might have actually already answered all these, and I always encourage you, uh, make sure that if you do, um, if you're working fast, feel free to work a little bit ahead here. And we do have uh, practice problems for homework, of course, as well. All right, so here we have a single thing. It looks like it's splitting apart. So since it's a single thing, we know this is going to be a first-order reaction. And then since it's splitting apart into two different things, is also a decomposition reaction. All right, going further down the line, I think we can pick up the pace here. Now you have two, one thing, once again, splitting apart into people of a first order reaction. Uh, and once again, it's decomposition because it's splitting. And then for our final example, it looks like it's the same thing. You got a chlorine gas. Chlorine gas is going to split apart, so it's just one thing. Since it's just one thing, you know it's going to be first order. And then since it splits, it's another example of a decomposition. All right. So there's a bunch of examples of both reaction types as well as reaction orders um, that show these elementary reactions. All right, um, so this one's a, there's a lot more words for this question, um, and so we'll break this down. This is going to be a reaction that shows up a whole bunch later on, and so um, especially in your chemistry studies, um, this is known as a, a unimolecular substitution reaction. Sometimes people call this SN1, um, so to be more specific. Don't worry about that yet. That'll come up in the future. Um, but what we want to do here is to notice what's really going on here, that this large reaction, this very commonly tested organic chemistry reaction, can actually be broken down into different elementary steps. And so let's break these down and figure out which is which. So as you can see, the very first reaction, we've got this compound where it's a bunch of carbons bound together with a bromine. And then that single compound splits into two different compounds. In fact, to be specific, you would call this your leaving group. That means I'll put LG there for leaving group. Uh, that bromine just took off of its own accord. Um, and so then this is your, as it's labeled there, your carbocation. We'll label this as well. So you got your carbocation, you got your leaving group. More importantly, you have something that split into two different things, which means this was a first order reaction. And uh, since it's one thing splitting apart, it'd be a decomposition. Reaction. So it's first order, decomposition is the first part right there. All right, um, there we go. And then the second step, notice we now have a single thing 
not, sorry, not a single thing. We have two different things. We've got your carbocation and your nucleophile. Once again, don't worry about the term nucleophile. You'll see that a whole bunch in the future, but anyone that might have studied organic chemistry will recognize that term. They're going to combine together to give you your final product. And since two things are combining here, we know this one must be second order, and this would be a synthesis reaction. And since it's two different things, you could even call it synthesis mixed as well. All right, um, so that's a good example of the future of your chemistry studying. Oh my gosh, you'll see a whole bunch of that in organic chemistry in the future. All right, that brings us to our uh, fourth learning goal. That's a little recap. We already saw that. Uh, the very fourth learning goal, let's talk about our next step, which is going a little bit further. Um, so single displacement and double displacement reactions. Um, once again, we're talking about elementary reactions. Still, we'll get into more complicated reactions. We're just introducing new reaction types, right? So we talked already about uh, decomposition. We talked about synthesis. Um, let's talk about displacement. All right, so in terms of these reactions, as we said, um, you can actually always have these things either splitting apart, combining together. Um, some people like to think of it as trading, though. So this atom, or sorry, this molecule decides to trade an atom with another molecule. And so you're getting a chemical reaction where you're basically shuffling around um, the atoms between different molecules. And so a single displacement, as the name says, it's a single thing that's being displaced. Uh, what happens is that some atom or group is transferred from one reactant to the other one. So they're basically not trading. It's more like this molecule says, I don't want this anymore. Here, you take it, you molecule, and it gives the atom away. There's not a single displacement, a single thing's being traded. It's a great way to think about that. All right, so here's a summarization. You've got A with something bound to it. B comes up to it and says, hey, A, can I have that X thing? And A says, sure, take it. And so then A gives B the X. Um, so it's basically an atom or groups being transferred um, with these uh, uh, single displacement steps. All right, so let's, um, oh, actually, we have one more little dot here. Um, so as we said before, this is occurred by the, uh, caused by the energetic collisions. This can only happen if your molecules get close enough together that you can actually form covalent bonds between atom uh, B and that X group that it's taking from atom A. And so remember, it's always got to be a collision. Otherwise, you can't get those electrons close enough that they can start sharing and forming a whole new bond. All right, let's, let's look at what this looks like in practice with a little image. Um, so here's an example of a single displacement reaction. Um, so this is the same thing that we saw before. Notice now you've got um, coppers holding on to this sulfate. Yeah, that's a sulfate group. Once again, don't worry if you don't know that that's sulfate. It's a sulfur and a bunch of oxygens. It's going to react with a zinc, um, that's, which is a metal, of course, as well. And it's going to basically, the zinc is going to say, hey, copper, can I have that sulfate? And copper is going to say, sure, you take it. And so now the zinc has the sulfate and the copper doesn't. That would be a classic example of a single displacement uh, reaction, where basically some species being traded back and forth between two molecules. All right. So that is our first part there. Um, let's talk about our third learning goal here. All right, so third one is a double displacement reaction. Um, so this is just not a single thing's being traded, but they decide to actually trade. So one atom gives another atom to a different, I guess, one molecule, you could say, gives its group away to another species, and that species gives a different group back to the molecule that did the giving. Um, and so it's a true exchange. This is more like a holiday. Everybody gets rid of something, and everybody gets something new. Um, and so there is, of course, a reaction where, notice, the X and the Ys are being traded between the Cs and the Ds, as you can see right there. Um, so you're trading out a group between each of these molecules. As before, though, this only happens, you can only form these new bonds when things actually collide together. So through that collision, um, you get um, new products formed. So let's look at what that actually looks like in practice as well. Here's a little double displacement guy for you. Um, so notice here we've got uh, barium and oxygen. We've got an iron with a sulfate group like we saw previously. And so what you're going to basically do is iron's going to say, oh, I want that oxygen. Barium's going to say, oh, I want that sulfate. And they're going to trade. So they swap them out. Bada bing, bada boom, and they've done a full exchange. It's like a holiday. Presents for everybody. But of course, in order to get a present, you got to give one to, at least in this double displacement situation. Of course, single displacement's different, right? There's just one thing being exchanged, but in double displacement, two things are being exchanged. All right, let's look at this in practice. I'm going to go through a question. Um, so we've got all of these different reaction types. We want to define what type they are. Um, and so let's go through them all. And so remember what we're really looking at is do we have two species actually getting one thing from each other or is there one person that's basically giving away something to the other atom? And so if you look here, notice on the left-hand side, the reactant side, you've got an O3 
On the right-hand side, you've only got an O2. So that means that this O3 species basically gave away an oxygen, giving your NO group another oxygen, making it NO2. Um, so that means since there was a, a giving from one side, it's not a double giving, right? You didn't, they didn't share here. Um, that would be known as a single displacement. All right. Um, going down the line, um, this is actually a similar reaction that we saw before. Notice it's actually that same copper sulfur reaction that we saw previously. In this case, that zinc's going to steal the sulfate from the copper, and the copper's left with nothing. So if a single thing gets exchanged, that is known as a single displacement reaction. Awesome. All right, we'll keep going further down the line. All right, so now looks like we've got some more things going on, maybe. It's hard to tell, so we'll want to look a little carefully and see if there's a true double exchange or if only one person's losing something. Uh, looking here, it looks like we've got a water molecule in terms of your reactants. Ooh, in the product side, it looks like water gave away something. It didn't get anything in return. In fact, this water molecule gave this, um, that's a hypochlorite ion. You don't need to know that yet, but in the future, you'll probably see that. Um, but so um, what the hypochlorite basically did was it stole one of the hydrogens from the water, leaving that poor water with nothing um, but a single hydrogen. Thus, it's now become a hydroxide ion. Um, and so since there wasn't a double exchange, um, this will once again be a single displacement reaction. All right. Um, so we'll keep going down the line as we see these. Uh, the next one looks like we've got this big old bromine species here, carbons and hydrogens and bromines together, and this poor little iodine all by itself. So as you can see in the product side, the iodine definitely got something. It's got a bromine, um, but looking back at your big species with carbons and hydrogens and bromines, it didn't gain anything. It just lost something. And so if it's not getting something in return, that's not a true exchange. There's no trade. It's more of a stealing. Uh, that's another example of a single displacement reaction. So just a single thing got swapped. All right. Um, going down further, uh, looking here, oh, we've seen this before. Notice we have that single species, only one. We've got a first order reaction, first one we've seen on this page. Um, so it's not going to be a single displacement nor a double displacement because you don't have two species interacting. Um, so in this case, it's a first order reaction, a single species. And as you saw before, um, this guy is now going to split, it seems, into two different things. And so if you have a single species splitting into two different things, um, this is known as a decomposition that we saw before, so decomposition reaction. All right, um, going a little further down the line, uh, looking here, we've got bromine and iodine. It's reacting with an iodine. We have two things, right? So we have a type of synthesis, whether it's single or double. We'll figure it out. Um, and as you can see, in this case, iodine looks like it's getting something. So iodine gains another iodine. It's I2. It just won the, the, won the exchange, and bromine's left with nothing. And since it's not left with anything, it is not a true double displacement. That would be another example of a single displacement. All right, um, looking at the bottom here, ah, so we've got a different type of reaction uh, once again. So no use, we have two things combining together, so it's second order, just like most of this page, except for item E. Uh, and it's now combining into a single thing I3. Ah, so it's not a displacement at all. It's not single displacement. It's not double displacement. This would be a synthesis reaction. Um, so given that it's I2 and I, you could also call this synthesis mixed, even though, yes, they're all iodine atoms, but since the molecules that are actually combining here um, are different, um, it's I2 and I minus. And notice, once again, people very frequently call these things molecules, even if they have a charge. Um, you're going to hear that all the time in your chemistry classes. So. All right, um, there's a bunch of examples showing how these reactions can be classified. Uh, let's check out the next question and go a little bit further. Um, and so this is another very common uh, reaction that you'll see in organic chemistry. And this one's called bimolecular, or SN2 substitution reaction. Um, so this reaction might look very advanced, but it's still elementary. We want to figure out what kind it is. And so here, we finally get to talk about something. Uh, notice that you have a molecule with two different species bound to it, chlorine and hydrogen. Here you've got a big old molecule with carbons and bromines. And notice that we, oh, interesting, we're actually going to do a little bit of an exchange here. Notice that the chlorine is going to be traded and given to the carbon compound there, um, whereas this bromine that was right there is actually going to go to the hydrogen. So in this case, you do have a true exchange. The hydrogen is going to basically get rid of a chlorine and gain a bromine. That carbon compound there is going to lose a bromine, gain a chlorine. And if you ever have a true exchange like that, everybody gives away something and gets something. 
Um, that is your classic example of a double displacement reaction. Awesome. So we saw a lot of single displacements on the previous page. Here's an example of a double displacement for you. All right, so that, that gets us to introduce, um, moving a little bit down, a little bit more, not, not complicated, but more advanced reactions as we go through. Um, let's get into our fifth learning objective and talk a little bit about um, these combined elementary reactions. So we're going to get multiple step reactions here. And so this is going to combine together everything that we talked about. Um, and so let, let's start doing this, this fusion. Um, so re remember, in reality, multiple reactions are actually a lot more complicated than a simple single displacement, double displacement, synthesis, or decomposition reaction. You actually have a bunch of different reactions that occur, a bit of a chain reaction going down the line until you finally get the products that you'll keep. Um, and so there's lots of different examples of this, but we're going to talk about how we take any big list of reactions and figure out what your net ionic equation is, what the net reaction that's going to occur between all of these different elementary reactions and how they get combined together. And so as I said, these chemical reactions can be many, 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 many steps, depending on how complicated you want to get. Um, and so whenever there, we get these multi-step mechanisms, um, we can basically break it down still, though, into individual steps. And so all the individual steps of these big complicated reactions are elementary reactions that will generally fall into one of the categories we talked about, single displacement, double displacement, decomposition, um, synthesis. Um, but the net reactions get a bit more complicated, and even those will have some more complicated names. And we won't go through the, the advanced naming systems today, not in this session, but in the future chem help classes, we definitely will. All right, so these individual steps basically go in order. Um, and so what often will happen is in the very first step, you'll get a product, and then that product is going to react with something else to give you another product, which reacts with another react and give you another product. And so a lot of your products are going to keep reacting, and thus you can call them both reactants and products. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, and so when we get those, and here's an example of what it would look like. Um, so we got a chemical reaction produces NOBr in two different steps. So notice your first step here is a synthesis same, right? So just two NOs are combining together to give you N2O2, your product. But then notice that your N2O2, it's not going to stick around. It's itself going to react again with a bromine. So notice that this N2O2, what we've effectively done is moved it down to the next step to show that N2O2, N2O2 will next combine with something else. And so the way to find your net reactions here is to realize that since this N2O2 is really just being redrawn as a reactant there, uh, that you can effectively cancel it out. So that means that your net reaction would be two NOs, I'll put these in green here, that are can combine with a Br2, giving you two molecules of NOBr. Um, so that's the standard way we write this, whatever the reactant is in the first step, you can write that as a product in the next. But if you're going to write it twice like that, that means you've got to cross it out because it's not getting reacted, it's getting used up. It's the way that people often describe that. All right, so that's the big idea, how we'll analyze these. We'll do lots of examples. Um, but so the, uh, the, the, the reaction orders here, let's go through these piece by piece and I'll actually erase all that little animation so we can focus on the actual question at hand. What is the reaction order and type of each elementary reaction step? Um, the first one, as we said before, we have two things coming together. So this is a synthesis. Uh, and as we said, this is synthesis of the same species. You don't need to specify same, you can just say synthesis. Um, but it's also, since two things are combining, that means that it is second order. Oops. Correct that typo there. Perfect. All right, so then the next step, uh, we've got N2O2 is combining with bromine. Uh, so same thing as before, you've got two things combining together. So that is a synthesis reaction. In this type, in this instance, it's a synthesis mixed. And it's also two things combining together. So that would also be second order. All right. Um, so if that first part was a little fast where I showed how we canceled it out, I'm going to take some time now to actually show that a little bit more in depth, break it down, and give you the actual or order of operations, I guess you could say, um, to do these reaction types. All right, so let's try this out. Um, so when we do get these, what we'll often do is look at our net or our overall reaction, as we said before. And I show that on the previous page. I'll get more specific and show more animations to make sure we are all uh, on the same page with this. All right, so the way that we find this is we basically get our list of elementary reactions. That's what we just showed you. There was two different steps there. And then once we list them all in order that they happen, anything that has become a reactant, so right, if it was a product of one species and then a reactant another one, 
you're basically writing it twice so you cross it out because that product was actually reacted again it has gone you've used it it's gone it's been used up and so we got to cross that out if it appears twice and so if any individual species right so just a one-to-one -one relationship ever appears in both the reactants and the products that means you can cross that one off once you've crossed that anything that appeared the same number of times on both reactants and product sides, you just add up what's ever left. So everything on the left, you add together, right? Everything on the reactant side, you add up. Anything on the right side, the product side, you add that up. And that gives you the full and notice automatically balanced net reaction. All right. So um, whenever we see these overall reaction orders, um, be aware, like, the number makes a big difference. And so we got to make sure that when you're looking at your net reactions, everything's fully balanced. I mean, that will automatically balance it at the very end. So it shows the number of each reactant molecules and number of each reactant um, products produced. And so keep track of the number of each species. It makes a very, very, very big difference. In fact, um, let, me, let me give an example here. We'll jump into a little animation after we do this. Here we go. So here's an example of a multi-step mechanism. Um, and so looking here, we've got, here we go. So it looks like our reaction is we have H2 is going to combine with ICL, forming HI and HCL. So that's just the first step, though. So I'll show you the other steps of this net reaction as well. The next step, though, is that that HI, right, this HI that we just formed, we're going to say, okay, we want to react this species. So we're going to redraw that as one of the reactants. Notice it's appearing down there again on the left-hand side. That's the reactant side. And it's going to react with another molecule of ICL giving you your total product there of I2 and HCl. So the way that we find our net reaction in any of these processes is we cross out things that appear in both the reactant and product side. In this case, it's only that HI. So once you get rid of anything that appears in both the reactant side and the product side, we just rewrite everything that is left up. So everything that is drawn on the left-hand side here, we put down here in the reactant side. Anything that's on the right-hand side, we write down in the product side. Um, so that gives us our net reaction of, as you can see, um, two ICLs for the reactants, as well as a little hydrogen gas, H2, as well as I2, and two HCLs, that's hydrochloric acid on the right-hand side. Um, so this right here, let's label this, this is considered your net reaction. And this would be labeled step one, and this would be labeled step two. Um, so each step is labeled as a step um, and then the final combined reaction, notice it's not a step at all. It's just showing you the net reaction that is left up afterwards. Step one, step two combined to give you a net reaction. All right. Let's go through a couple practice problems and um, see what this actually looks like in action. Oh, we already did that one. Here we go. All right. Um, so this is the same one that we saw before. Um, so this is the overall balanced reaction. Um, previous question it's been reprinted there um, as we did before um, so we actually already did this one but so notice the way that you would do your full net ionic equation cross out anything that appears on the reactants and the product side and then you add up everything on the reactant side in this case you get two molecules of NO um, that's going to combine with your BR2 then all of that will react by giving you your total products which in this case is listed as just two NOBR so that would be your net reaction, once again. So cancel anything in the reactants and product side, and you've got your total reaction. All right. Um, so let's do the same thing here. So this one's a little bit more complicated. We have more going on, but it's the exact same steps as before. If we want to, as you can see, find the overall balanced reaction, so your net reaction, the first thing that we have to do is cross out anything that appears in both the reactants and product side. Um, so let's go through this full list, and it looks like we've got, oh, C2H4Br. That cancels out. Same thing there, so that cancels out as well. I'm um, going a little bit further. And we'll use this color coded to make it easier. Hopefully you notice another one. I'll give you a second to notice it. And, oh, there it is. IBR appears in the product side. It also appears in step three in the reactant side. Uh, so then looking through, we want to just double check. I uh, Notice we have bromine. Oh, that's only on the right. Uh, we have that's called, uh, that's not ethane, that's ethene. Um, don't worry about the naming there, but it's a two-carbon compound of carbon. That doesn't appear anywhere else. Uh, bromine doesn't appear on the left-hand side. I2, oh, there's another one. So we've identified another species that appears on both the product side, I2, and the reactant side, I2. 
Um, and that leaves us with nothing left that can cancel out. So we can then write up our full and balanced net equation. Um, so all we do, once again, is to think of this as a division between the reactants and the products. Anything that's on the reactant side, we're going to write on the left-hand side. Anything on the product side, we'll write on the right-hand side. Um, so that means on our left here, we've got a molecule of C2H4Br2 is going to combine with, notice count up the iodines there, three I minuses. Um, and then that's going to react, as we can see, to give us our final products. Here of we've got an C2H4, um, as well as two bromines plus Br. Notice that negative charge on the bromine, so plus two Br minuses. And finally, we've got that iodine, that's I3, also with a negative charge on it. Um, so that would be our net reaction. Notice everything else has been canceled out. And if you look at the species, you'll see that this is already perfectly and completely balanced. Works out great. Let's check out another problem. Uh, so next problem says, um, we're going to come back to that unimolecular substitution reaction. We want to figure out its overall balanced reaction, um, giving both of these steps together. All right, so same thing as before. We always try to identify um, what's on the reactant side, what's on the product side, cancel out anything that appears on both. In this case, our carbocation intermediate. And so that's another term that we'll talk about more in the future. But anytime you have a reactant, or sorry, a product that gets formed and then gets used up all the way before the reaction is done with, you can call these intermediates. Notice because it's an intermediate in the pathway to your final products. So we'll talk more about that term in the future, but be aware that's called an intermediate, carbocation intermediate in this context. Um, and so then that gives us our total react, uh, product because it looks like nothing else appears on both the reactants and product side. You might be tempted to think this one does, but notice in your reactant side that carbon has a bromine bound to it. In the product side, it's got a fluorine bound to it. So while it looks similar, that is not the same species, so we cannot cancel it out. All right, so then we just um, add these things up. Um, and so then that gives us our final product here where we've got your... Uh, actually, I'm just going to draw a box around these. You guys can add up the totals. Um, so notice that you've got your uh, uh, bromine carbon con conglomerate there. Uh, you've got your fluorine on the left-hand side. So those green boxes there are your reactants. On the right-hand side, we've got bromine as a product as well as your new fluorinated carbon compound there as your product. Um, and so if we look at our net reaction, notice what we're saying here is that you are combining together this species with this species. I'll put a circle around that. And then you are getting your final products, I'll put this in gold over here, of bromine and this new carbon with a fluorine attached to it. And so what you're effectively doing, as you can see, is you have a species that is combining and knocking off another species. There we go. So that's our overall balanced reaction, given both of those steps together. All right, let's move on to the fifth one here. Um, so he, this is an interesting question now, because notice that they're giving you something that doesn't work. It seems to be broken. In fact, it tells you that the method fails in this case. Huh. So there's got to be something wrong with it. And even though, I'll try to go through what, they're, what the person tried to do here. They did it incorrectly, but what they attempted to do was they canceled out the NO3, they canceled out the NO3, and we got this. Oh, and then we also canceled out, as you can see, uh, the NO2 there and the NO2 there, uh, which leaves you with this final product. But it does not work. Um, and you might have noticed this. The reason that it does not work is because this reaction has an unbalanced elementary reaction. If you're going to set up your steps, the elementary steps must be balanced first. And if all of the elementary steps are balanced, then the final net reaction will also be balanced. Notice that you're saying you have one nitrogen that basically splits apart into two different nitrogens. That's not possible. Like you're, you know, there's no matter just spontaneously created. We're just rearranging our atoms there. And so the problem is that this, in order to be balanced, you would have had to have two equivalents of NO2. And so if you had two equivalents of NO2, if we did do this correctly, notice that you would cancel out the NO2 there and only one of those NO2s there. And then you can cancel out your NO3, cancel out your NO3, and then your net reaction that actually would work would be to make this into an NO2 plus your carbon monoxide, CO. So that would have been the full balanced one. 
Um, but we needed to make sure that both of these equations were balanced from the very beginning. And notice there, your nitrogen's balanced, your carbon's balanced, and your oxygen's balanced in your final net equation. So that would have worked if this was balanced in the first place. All right. So let's move on to our final topic for today. Um, the last thing we'll talk about is just uh, one more example of a more complicated reaction. And we're not going to spend too much time with this, um, but we do want to introduce one of the very common multi-step reaction mechanisms that we see all the time. Um, and that is... Uh, um, well, we'll talk about combustion, but we'll talk about these uh, reactions in general, but combustion will be the one that we do focus on here. Um, all right, so in these multi-step reaction mechanisms, um, just like in your elementary reactions, um, we can classify them a bunch of different ways. Um, so you can call them decomposition, you can call them synthesis, you can call them single displacement or double displacement. Um, so you can get these net reactions um, from larger reactions as well. All right, so... Um, when we classify these multiple steps, um, we base it on their overall reaction number. Um, and so when we go through these, uh, the, I guess the idea here is that you want, if you want to identify the overall reaction step, you can get things more than second order, more than third order, or sorry, more than first or second. You can even get third order. But that's only for your net reaction. Elementary steps, you are stuck to either first order or second order. That's really all we can do here. All right, so um, here's an example. Um, so given this stepwise mechanism, you know, what's the type and order of each step? And then we want to figure out the order, of the overall reaction as well. All right, so this was the corrected version of that reaction that we just did. Um, and so let's go through and actually balance our final reaction here. Um, so if we do our full balancing, let's kind of set this up. And notice that we can cancel out quite a few species. Uh, we can cancel out just as before, so this is a little repeat. NO3 cancels, NO3 cancels. You can also cancel out one of those nitrites. That's their NO2 group there. Get rid of one of those as well. And so that leaves us with our final reaction here of... Uh, that's all canceled. Yep, totally. Uh, we've got a CO being added to an NO2. Um, and that is going to give you your final product of NO plus CO2. All right, um, and so then here, as you can see, if we look at each of the steps, so we'll go through the question, it says, you know, um, what is the order of each step and what's the type and order of the overall reaction? Notice the first step here, um, we have two NO2s coming together, so this would be a synthesis step, and this is the same. Uh, and since it is two different things combining together, we would also call this second order. So there's a second order reaction step, Right, just step one, because two things combine, and that gives you, of course, your products, the synthesis step. Oh, actually, I take that back. That's not a synthesis step. Uh, notice I crossed that out, so I wasn't looking at it. But notice the step itself, you got two NO2s combining together, and what we're effectively doing, this we should balance this first, uh, is notice that this NO group basically lost an oxygen. So what happened was this NO2 effectively stole an oxygen from the other NO2 group. And since it's stolen oxygen from the other NO2 group, it didn't get anything in exchange. And this actually is a displacement reaction. So it's not synthesis because you do get two products. I apologize. I crossed it out and stopped looking at it. But yes, it's still there. We're looking at the individual steps. Um, and so here is this would be a, a single displacement. So I apologize for that. That's your first step. All right, so I'm going to... I'll erase these so we can go through this piece by piece. And then I'll, we'll, we'll go through the net afterwards and how we balance that. All right, so next step, looking here, notice you have an NO3 that's reacting with a CO group. Once again, notice that your CO group is effectively stealing an oxygen from your NO3 group. It's not giving anything back. It's taking it, and it's keeping it for itself, uh, which means that is also a single displacement reaction. All right, so we got two single displacement reactions, and same as before, since two things combine together, that is also a second order reaction. All right, so that's your two different steps as individual steps. Now, if we go back to our final 
net reaction. Notice it works out the same way as um, your other steps. It could be single displacement, double displacement, synthesis, anything like that. Um, but notice in this specific scenario, once we balance this guy, um, you can see that we have our CO group is effectively stealing an oxygen from your NO2 group. It's not getting anything back. It's just losing an oxygen, which means this would also be your net reaction is second order. Um, and it is also a single displacement reaction. All right. So that is your net reaction. Remember, if you did struggle with identifying how you find the net reaction, you just cross off species that are on the reactant side and the product side, which is how we got rid of our NO2 on the left and NO2 on the right, and NO3 on the left and NO3 on the right as well. All right, let's do another example that gets us a little bit more complicated. Um, so in this one, we want to know why must the following reaction be an overall reaction and not an elementary reaction? Um, so the reason that this can't be an elementary reaction is because as we said at the very beginning of the session, there is no such thing as a third order elementary reaction. It's too difficult to get three things combined together at the exact same time in the exact same space. Or these are tiny little molecules moving through a fairly large environment. Um, and so that means that um, since three things combined, it's not an elementary reaction. It's an overall. It's already been balanced for us. We're basically good to go. So now all we got to do is say, all right, what kind of reaction is this? All right, so now since it is one, two, three, notice there's two silver nitrates there. NO3 is a nitrate group. If you don't know the name yet, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but so since there's three things coming together, that means that this is, in fact, a third order reaction. So this is third order order. It's the first time we've seen that, but remember this is third order um, in terms of the net reaction. There's no such thing as third order for an elementary reaction, so this must be a net reaction. here. And then to figure out the type of reaction we have, notice you have, oh nice, you actually get a perfect exchange. In this case, notice calcium is going to steal this nitrate group from the silver there, so you get calcium nitrate. And additionally, your silver is going to take the chlorine from the calcium. So you got a perfect exchange. And whenever you have a perfect exchange, that means it is a double displacement. So it's a third order double displacement reaction. All right. So um, the other thing we'll talk about for the very last part of class here um, is more complicated reactions. Now we're not going to talk about a lot of these today, um, but the more common named reactions that go above just decomposition, synthesis, and single and double displacement are things like redox, neutralization, precipitation, substitution. There's a lot of different types. Um, one of the common ones though, and the ones that we're going to talk about here, um, is combustion specifically. And so with all of these, whether it's oxidation, combustion, all of that, um, the elementary steps may not be the same as the overall reaction type. We might not even really know yet the specifics of the elementary reactions for some of these more complex reactions. And so because of that, we just want to focus on the nets for these. We want to think about the big picture, and you do need to know these individual named reactions for your chemistry class. Maybe not the very beginning, but by the end of the session, or the end of the class, the semester, um, you're definitely going to have to know quite a few of them. All right, so the one we'll talk about today is combustion. And so combustion is a very common one. It's any time that you burn hydrocarbons, so like fuel. Like So for example, um, here actually let's show you an example problem. Um, so here's an example problem. We got propane. So propane, as you know, we run our grills with it in the summer. It's a very common fuel. And the way that we use it to make heat is we combust it. So in order for fuel to burn, you need oxygen, right? That's why you can smother a fire and it goes out. It needs oxygen to burn. So if you get fuel, you get oxygen, and you give it a spark to get over that energy of activation that we talked about before, it's going to explode. It's going to burn, and that gives you carbon dioxide and water as a product. Now, this is a very, 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 very common reaction. You want to know combustion is take hydrocarbon, add oxygen, blow it up, and that makes carbon dioxide and water. So that's a huge reaction. Now, what we'll try to do here, though, is to make this a little bit easier. Like, of course, you could just balance this. We had a previous session on your chem help sessions that did talk about balancing equations. But I just want to show you a shortcut, a way that you can balance these uh, combustion reactions a little bit faster and more efficient than going through the standard route of just counting out all your species. Um, and so here is a shortcut for you. Um, it is right here. All right, so here's your standard formula. And we're going to use um, propane again. 
um, because that was the example we had from that problem. Um, but if you think of the number of X's, or the number of carbons you have, this works for any hydrocarbon. So it could be propane with three carbons, it could be butane with four carbons, it could be pentane with five carbons, hexane with six. Now you might not know that nomenclature yet, but in the future you'll know the difference between you know methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, and all the way down the line. It's part of the chemistry nomenclature. Um, but nomenclature aside, all you got to do is figure out the number of carbons you have, which will give you a consistent number of hydrogens as well. And so to figure out the full balanced equation, all you have to do is say that you have x plus y, so that's the number of carbons plus the number of hydrogens divided by 4, and you're going to get the total of x number of CO2s, which makes sense because you only got one carbon there, one carbon there, so if you have two carbons on the left, you have two carbons on the right. And then to determine the number of waters, all you do is you take the number of hydrogens divided by 2, which makes sense because notice all of your hydrogens appear right there in the products, and you get two hydrogens per water, so you're only going to get half the number of water molecules. All right, so if you want to memorize this formula, feel free to do so. Of course, you can also use the, the standard route of balancing equation we've done in the past, um, but this is what will offer. 8, the number of hydrogens, divided by 4, um, giving you a total of 5 oxygens. You'll have 3 CO2s, and then you'll have 8, because that's the number of hydrogens, divided by 2, thus 4 waters. And that gives you your final balance equation of ethane, or sorry, propane. It's going to give you, well, F propane combined with five molecules of oxygen is going to combine together to give you three carbon dioxides and four water molecules. All right. And that brings us to the end of your reaction types class on ChemHelp. Um, all right. So we've got more classes coming in the future. Um, so as we go along, we'll keep getting more and more advanced as your semester progresses and gets more challenging as well. Right. Take care and have a good rest of your afternoon.